This is module 2, Philosophies of Men. This module has five lessons. The lesson one is about Western philosophy focused on the Socratic period. The lesson two is medieval period. The lesson three is modern period. The lesson four is the existentialist philosophy. And the lesson five is about Eastern philosophy. Let's begin! This is Lesson 1, Western Philosophy, Socratic Period. The philosophical tradition is usually divided into Western and Eastern philosophies. The Western philosophy refers to the philosophy and philosophical traditions in Europe and the Americas, while Eastern refers to the philosophy and the philosophical traditions in Asia. Let's have a quick contrast between these two traditions. Western philosophy is typically fragmentary in nature. When we say fragmentary, the presentation is usually one topic after another. For example, intellect only, emotions only, internal senses only, external senses only. In that sense, Western philosophy is specific in nature. Another thing is that it is linear, which means everything has beginning and end. On the other hand, Eastern philosophy is holistic in nature. The intellect, emotions, senses, and spirit are presented interconnectedly. In that case, it is general. Another thing is that Eastern philosophy is not linear, but cyclical in nature. Moreover, Western philosophy covers religion, science, and other rationalistic thinking. The approach to a deeper understanding involves the application of symbolic thoughts, like words in logic and numbers in mathematics. So, it relies heavily on thinking processes, especially with the use of logic. We will see the Eastern philosophy in the last part of the module. Let's proceed now and let's start this module 2, lesson 1. Let's answer this. According to him, man is the measure of all things, of all things that are, that they are, and of things that are not, that they are not. A. Pythagoras B. Protagoras C. Anaximenes and letter D. Heraclitus You've got 5 seconds, teacher. And your answer is? Yep, that's right. It's Protagoras. Well, who are these people? Do you know them? Technically, there were, they were from the pre-Socratic period. While it would be nice to start our discussion with Socrates, the first prominent figure in the history of philosophy, the truth is that Socrates did not come up with his views out of nothing. He grew in a remarkably fertile philosophical environment within Greece, and that had been germinating for a couple of centuries, and we call this early period as pre-Socratic period. There were over 100 pre-Socratic philosophers and we will see some of them in this lesson. For more than three centuries, the pre-Socratic philosophers focused on the three key issues. These were their preoccupations. The first one is the one and the many. Here, they were trying to explain how a basic thing can be the source of many varied things. They tried to explain that all things come from one common source and the real challenge for them was to identify that common source. The second thing is change and constancy. They tried to explain how many things or how things remain the same or constant as they change over time. Everything in the world is subject to change. The third issue was about relativism. Here, they were trying to determine whether principles are absolute or created by people. Are there universal truths? applicable to you and me and to everybody? If there are, what are they? The first known philosophers of ancient Greece were from the city-state called Miletus. Philosophers were typically grouped according to their place of origin and ideas. So they were Miletians, Aeonians, Eleatics, Pluralists, Atomists, and Sophists. The first three philosophers from Miletus, called Miletians, were Thales or Thales, Anaximenes, and Anaximander. 
We will briefly talk about Thales and Anaximenes here. All of them attempted to answer the question, what is the common stuff from which everything is composed? For Thales, it was water. Water is the basic stuff of all things. Lahat ng bagay ay may tubig o pwedeng gawa sa tubig. For Anaximenes, it was air. Then, we have the Ionians, represented here by Pythagoras, who claim that the underlying principles of reality are numbers and mathematical relations. Maybe you're familiar with Pythagorean theorem and other mathematical formulas created by him. Pythagoras was a great philosopher and mathematician. Then, we have the Sophists, the wise ones, represented here by Protagoras, who was the most famous of the Sophists. He is remembered for his relativist statement that man is the measure of all things. If you're interested in these pre-Socratic philosophers, kindly do a further reading online. They are super interesting. Let's now proceed to the substance of this lesson. In Socratic period, the philosophy was revolutionized through the use of Socratic method, which developed the method of definition, analysis, and synthesis. Here, we will see Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Let's talk about Socrates first. For Socrates, man or human is a thinking and willing being. We have the intellect and the will. We have the capacity to think, to know, to discover, to analyze, to synthesize, and so on. We are capable of choosing. For him, the soul has the primacy over the body since the soul is immaterial. As humans with intellect, our responsibility is to discover the truth, especially the truth about the good life, because it is in knowing the good life that we can act correctly. And knowing the truth includes knowing more about ourselves or discovering more about ourselves. Thus, his famous line, Know thyself. But how can we do this? We can know more about ourselves when we do reflections, introspections, because, he said, an unreflected life is not worth living. These last two lines attributed to Socrates usually come out in the board exam, so please know them by heart. We now come to Plato. Plato, a disciple of Socrates, founded the famous academy in Athens. This was the first institution of the higher learning in the Western world. And perhaps Plato was the first philosopher whose almost complete works are still available to us. And perhaps he is the best known, most widely studied, and most influential philosopher of all time. We study Plato in some of his works in school. For Plato, the nature of the human person is seen in the duality of body and soul. The body is material, destructible, and mutable. The soul is immaterial, indestructible, and immutable or unchangeable. Plato is credited for idealism and essentialism. He has a lot of works and one of his famous contributions is his theory of forms. Let's talk about idealism first. Idealism is a metaphysical and epistemological doctrine or belief that ideas or thoughts make up fundamental reality. Through time, idealism became so broad that it included many religious viewpoints, but originally, idealism did not necessarily include God or supernatural being or life after death. It was in the Christian era when idealism became so popular, especially when it was adopted by Christian philosophers and theologians like Augustine of Hippo. Let's simplify it. In layman's term, idealism describes a person's high ideals, like principles or values or standards. The word idealist is commonly used as an adjective to designate qualities of perfection, desirability, and excellence. Kaya sa values education, may itinuturo tayo na highest form of good or ideal values, mga pag-uugali o katangian na sinisikap nating makamit o taglayin at isabuhay ng ating mga mag-aaral. So, that is how we use the and apply idealism in values education. Let's now move to essentialism. What is essentialism? Essentialism is another broad school of thought. 
in education, it, it is states that children should learn the traditional basic subjects thoroughly and rigorously. Essentialist teachers, uh, essentialist teachers teach children progressively, that is, from simple to complex skills. In values education, essentialism is teaching the basic or traditional values that the students may need to be a good person or a good and law-abiding citizens. So, essential, basic, and traditional values to be included in the values education curriculum. Now, let's briefly talk about Plato's theory of form, which was apparently the origin of Plato's idealism. For us to appreciate this theory, let's consider the historical and cultural context of Plato in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, Greece. Plato was influenced by skepticism, those who deny that we can have a real knowledge of truth. Plato saw that this world is changing. Seasons change, people change, people die, we go through ups and downs, we have imperfections, and since this world is changeable, this is an unreliable source of truth. We cannot rely on this. It's changeable. But behind this unreliable world, there is an unchanging world of permanence. Totoong mundo, hindi chismis. <laughs> and this world is permanent. We can rely on this as a source of truth. And Plato called this as the world of forms or the world of ideas. Lahat ng nandito sa ating daidig ay imperfect at ang perfect forms nila ay matatagpuan sa world of ideas. In other words, ang lahat ay kopya lamang o anino lamang ng mga totoong umiiral o nag-i-exist sa world of ideas. So, philosophically, Plato calls it world of ideas. But religious people may call it heaven, paradise, nirvana, janna, and so on. As long as that place or state of being connotes a certain kind of perfection or desirability. If you read Plato further, you will see that his theory of forms is connected to his other theories like his theory of knowledge or epistemology and politics with the philosopher king. We will get back to Plato in other lectures, but for now, let's proceed to the next philosopher in the Socratic period. Let's talk about Aristotle. He is another prominent philosopher from the Socratic period. Aristotle was in direct contrast with his teacher Plato. Instead of embracing idealism, he put forward the doctrine of realism that he taught in his own school known as the Lyceum. Realism is the belief that reality exists independent of the mind. Ang isang bagay ay umiiral o nag exist kahit maisip mo man ito o hindi. The ultimate reality is in the world of objects. Ang realidad ay nandito sa mundong ginagalawan natin. So, for Aristotle, there is no dualism. There is no dichotomy between our body and soul. They are in a state of unity. And since there is no duality, the matter and form, like the body and the soul, are inseparable. Whether, where there is a matter, there, is, there also is the form. Aristotle's contributions are substantial, especially in the, in the fields of ethics, politics, aesthetics, metaphysics, logic, and science. He has a lot of contributions that you can easily find online in case you would like to do some further reading. Let's look at this painting inside the Vatican City by Raphael, the Italian Renaissance artist between 1509 and 1511. In the left is Plato, pointing above. That represents his philosophy of idealism. While in the, left, in the right is Aristotle, pointing below, showing his philosophy of realism. For Plato, reality is made up of ideas. For Aristotle, reality is the actuality, and the truth is demonstrable through the world of objects that we see. And as far as values education is concerned, idealism pursues a higher standards of behaviors and virtues. On the other hand, realism focuses on the actual experiences of humanity. So, for Aristotle, a human person is a political animal. As evident in the reality of human community, there is a need to establish a government to protect and pursue the common good of the people. That brings us to the end of this lesson. The Socratic period ended at the time when Christianity was already flourishing. And the history was entering a new era, which is the medieval period. 
To recap, we discussed the philosophies of men from some of the pre-Socratic philosophers and from Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. That's the module 2 lesson 1, Western Philosophy Socratic Period. See you in the next video.